As we continue our trip in Charleston, South Carolina on this episode of On the Map, we will stroll down King Street during both evening and afternoon to dine at the McIntosh Charleston and take a sweet break at Cupcake down south. Then we head over to take a daytime tour of historic Charleston with our expert tour guide Linda Jones, who is the tour director for Absolutely Charleston. The best place to begin your evening in Charleston is on King Street, where you will find the pulse of the nightlife of the city. And looking for a fun evening and being so hungry, we find ourselves looking for a lively restaurant when we come across the Macintosh Charleston. This is the Macintosh. Uh, we are part of the Indigo Road Restaurant Group here in Charleston, South Carolina. You can find us at 479B on King Street, Charleston. If you want to know a little bit about the restaurant, we started in September 2011. It's coming up on four years now. I've been here since day one. I'm one of a few people left from day one. Uh, it's changed a lot. We've done a lot of things to kind of um, keep the restaurant moving and grooving and improving in a lot of different ways. In the past year and a half, we have done some extensive renovations on our patio out in the back. Uh, we now fully seat an extra 50 people out back with full covered seating, fans, heaters, so we're open year-round on our patio, uh, able to accommodate a lot of different kind of parties, a lot of different kind of groups. It's pretty cool. Uh, the menu itself, local and seasonal, and those are kind of our two driving uh, themes here, so we never really run specials at all. Uh, the menu just changes daily depending on what we're getting in locally and seasonally uh, from the different local vendors that we have. We source almost 100% of our produce from local farms here around the low country. We're very lucky here in Charleston. We have so many farms around us, Lowland and Curious and uh, a few uh, Kennedy Farms uh, and Ambrose Farms, all these great producers of products that we can source from. And just in that same, uh, that same vein, we can uh, source all of our seafood locally. And very, very cool. Mark Mahefka with uh, Abundant Seafood operating out of Shem Creek over in Mount Pleasant. He brings us seafood from up, up and down the East Coast. What's really unique about the Macintosh is that they print their restaurant menus daily, taking into consideration whatever the chef feels like cooking that evening. No matter what's on the menu, know that it's going to, for sure, be a fun evening. The Macintosh is well known throughout Charleston as they have been featured in several magazines such as Charleston Magazine, Charleston Living, and Charleston Weddings. They have also been featured in Esquire Magazine as one of the best new restaurants. Hi, I'm Jager Peter, the chef de cuisine at the Macintosh. We've been open for about four years. Uh, the executive chef and owner is Jeremiah Bacon. Uh, I've been working with him for about six years. Um, here at the Macintosh, we really just tried to you know, be inspired by seasonal food and seasonal fish. Um, you know, really just whatever comes in the door. So it's, it's fun, we print a menu every day. Um, we're not limited to just any kind of cuisine. We can do whatever cuisine we want, from Asian to you know, ethnic to Indian. So we're, we just act like to have a lot of fun. We give you a product and give you some food that you enjoy to eat and that you, know, you get to have fun with as well. On this beautiful morning in Charleston, we're heading downtown to meet up with Linda Jones and take a tour of the more historic parts of the city. The tour begins with a brief history of Charleston and the surrounding area. Charleston was founded in 1670, okay? It was no accident. The English scouted the Carolina coastline. They discovered this, this deep harbor right off the ocean here. Um, they sailed up the Ashley River. See, this is the city here. They sailed up this river, settled over here, 1670. And um, they stayed here about 10 years, they didn't like it. By 1680, they moved the whole town right back over here on the tip facing the ocean, the ocean's right here. They moved back over here because it was cooler and they had an excellent lookout over the Atlantic Ocean. We're named for King Charles II. King Charles claimed Carolina 
in 1670 was all of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, from the Atlantic Ocean as far west as the Pacific. That includes North Carolina, okay? All of it was called Carolina. Well, this was ridiculous. It was a land grab. If you could make a Gova settlement, it was yours. King Charles, he thought this was worthless. You know, heat, mosquitoes, malaria. He gives it away. He gave it to eight men. These eight men had helped him regain his throne from Cromwell, okay? Cromwell, uh, King Charles I lost his head. King Charles II didn't want to make anybody mad at him. <laughs> he gives, so he, these men, he gives them Carolina. Think of these proprietors. They were called Lord's proprietors. Think of them as early developers. They're interested in profits. So they send the first ship, the settlers that go up the river. They want profits, okay? One of those men took a real special interest in the welfare of the citizens, not so much the money. They named everything after him. His name was Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper. This is the Cooper River and the Ashley River, both named for that one man, okay? So the folks came back over here because it was cooler and they could see the ocean. But they were under constant threat by the Spaniards. Spaniards were down in St. Augustine, okay? They were down there in 1565. And the King of Spain claimed Florida went to the Virginia line. Oh dear, we got a problem. And the Spaniards were livid about this Charlestown. So in 1700, folks here put walls up, right there, walls. South Wall, North Wall was Cumberland Street, right there. And Church Street was Main Street. Now the hotel where I met y'all is on that corner. That Meeting Street was a wall. So this architecture in here is 18th century and tight. Everybody wanted to live inside those walls for protection, okay? Well, the walls were up about 30 years. Then they started to move this way, that way. Now we're over here, okay? A lot of this is Victorian, built later. The oldest part of the city is right there. And I'll get y'all back over there in a few minutes. But I want you to ride, I'm gonna ride you out here first. And I'll maybe I should do the older part of the city and then come back to this. Yeah, let's do that. We'll, we would, instead of going backwards, we'll do it. We'll do the colonial first and then come back to Antebellum and Victorian, all right? It's really easy to spot the difference, okay? Once you know kind of what you're looking at, but it's a miracle what we, um, what we have left. See, after the Civil War, we were lucky. I told you, Sherman's army bypassed us, all right? They're climbing back, getting there on their feet again. Sig uh, 1886, 20 years after the war, this city was struck by an earthquake. We're on a major earthquake fault line. The earthquake, they say, would have measured about a 7.3, 7.4 on a Richter scale. So they had to climb back from that. I'm gonna show y'all some earthquake vaults. A lot of this side of town is built of wood. Why? They were built after 1865. A fire went through here and they were terrified um, of the brick houses after the earthquake because the brick they saw crumble. The wood would give. So after the earthquake, they were too poor to build in brick, for one thing, too poor and they were afraid of it after the earthquake. Now I want y'all to see that building at the end of the street. It's got a cupola on top. See that little cupola on top of that building? It was built by the British. I'll get you closer. Um, right behind it is the Cooper River, right behind that. Look at the marble front on this one over here. Don't you see that little yellow building back there? That was the kitchen. By law, kitchens had to be separate 
from the main houses. Had to be built of brick and had to be separate. They, because of fire, they were terrified of fire. No way to stop fire in their day, okay? Windy day, windy night. And we don't need the hearth for warmth most of the year. They wanted that heat in the backyard, out of the house. So kitchens were separate. Second floor, that's a two-story building. Second floor with the slave quarters. You'll see a lot of those around town. Um, these buildings today are very popular. Um, people rent them out. Everybody wants to live down here. And they, but they don't want the maintenance, the upkeep, and the taxes of these big ones. So that people rent them out a lot. Another thing about the African American history, it really started here in this city. We were the, sad but true, we were the largest importer of Africans. 40% of the Africans brought to this country came through the port of Charleston. Sad but true, you know. Now, there was a large free black society here too. Um, New Orleans and Charleston had the largest numbers of free persons of color. That's what they were called. They earned their freedom or they were given freedom upon the death of a mistress or a master, something like that. We've got so much history here, both Revolutionary War, Civil War, all of it. George Washington visited this city. He was here for a week in 1791. We can tell you every step he took. We have every cherry side. We have the house where he stayed, you know. It's easy to make history come alive here because you can see it in Charleston. Now, this was Main Street, 1700. Church Street was Main Street. I'm going to go right down the middle. We're going to see the house where George Washington stayed. That's open for visitors. Wonderful uh, 18th century. The house belonged to Thomas Hayward. Thomas was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas was down on his plantation. This was Thomas's townhouse here. Now see this side of the street and look at the other side of the street. You can tell which one's older. This one on the left. When you see brick and you see them right on the street like this, these are the older. Something happened here, and I do know what it was. Cannonball hit this corner Christmas Eve, 1863. There was a big fire. So that these were built much later when they couldn't afford brick. See, all of these are wood. This is all brick. This house belonged to Theodosia Burr. Theodosia was the only child of Aaron Burr. She married a man from Charleston, and that was their townhouse. This was the inspiration for Porgy and Bess, what we call Catfish Row. Went on to become famous. George and Ira Gershwin came here and put the story, it was a love story, put it to music. Um, summertime and the living is easy. See, there's, this is Catfish Row. And this is the house coming up where George Washington stayed. If you find a break in your day, fill up with cupcakes at Cupcake Down South. Located at the heart of King Street, you can't miss this boutique bakery turning out the best cupcakes daily. Hi, we're here with Julia at Cupcake Down South and she's going to let us try some cupcakes. Yes, we are so excited you're here. Welcome to Charleston, South Carolina. We got some of our most delicious flavors here for you to try today. So I'm going to give you the rundown. First we have turtle, which is with our famous cream cheese icing and chocolate cake with caramel and a praline on top, which is really a well-known treat here in Charleston. And this is our black bottom cupcake, which is one of the most popular flavors, and it has cream cheese baked into the cake. So it's cream cheese and chocolate baked into the cake with, of course, our signature cream cheese icing. So then we're gonna get into some of our more summer flavors, which is right here we have key lime pie. And this is a tangy, sweet, delicious lemon cake topped with the lime, creamy buttercream icing and topped with some little, you know, graham cracker crumbles on top we have there. 
and this is our white chocolate raspberry. So this is just our, our delicious vanilla cake with raspberries whipped into the icing and white chocolate on top. This one is our lemon blue cupcake, and yes, that is a lemon head candy on top. And this cake is also lemon cake baked in with the blueberries and our buttercream icing. And last but not least is the vanilla bean cupcake. It is the old faithful delicious classic that just never goes out of style. Which one are you gonna try first? Which one should we try? The key lime pie. Go for it. What do you think? I'm really fan of key so I think that tastes a lot better. It does? Good, good. Okay, worth another bite. That's pretty good. <laughs> I want to try the vanilla because I'm a huge vanilla fan. Okay. A lot of people have their own unique way of actually eating the cupcake. Some people prefer to do like you're doing. We even have some people who come in and cut the cupcake in half and put it over the icing and then eat it like a sandwich, which is like genius. Like, why didn't I think of that? But then there are more people who are more icing fans, some people who are more cake fans. But what do you think? It's really good. Good. It's so good. Really? Yes. Going for the lemon blue. Yeah. So we have 15 flavors every day. We rotate. Um, we have limited edition flavors. We rotate in and out every two weeks. So there's always something new. We're always working with innovative flavors and new ideas and trying to change it up and keep people coming back for more cupcakes. We've been here for 10 years and we just keep getting sweeter as that's what we try to do. And our next flavor cupcake we're coming out with is Sweet Tea and we're working with um, Firefly. Sweet Tea. Yeah, Sweet Tea Cupcake. And we're working with Firefly Distillery to come out with the um, Sweet Tea flavor. So next time you're in Charleston, you'll come back and try it. Yeah, we're going to try and work with local breweries and distilleries to kind of give it some Charleston flavor. And um, the Firefly Sweet Tea is going to be the first one up. If you're a cream cheese fan, go for the black bottom. I'm going to try that one. <laughs> I have to butcher it. That's okay. <laughs> That's really good. So which one's your favorite? I like... <laughs> I'm gonna try this. Let's try this white chocolate cheesecake. Yeah. That looks so good. It's almost like they're so pretty, you don't wanna mess them up. <laughs> but don't be scared. Alright. That's my favorite. Okay, okay. so we have chocolate raspberry. I like this one. Go after my heart. It looks chocolate. like a <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Well, you should try the turtle. You can have it. It's a good thing Charleston's a walking city because as much eating as we like to do down here, you're you're gonna need to walk it off. It's really good too. You have the caramel in there. Mm -hmm. The praline on top is the best part. All of these were great to sample. They were. Yeah, we should take them all home with us. Yeah, absolutely. We should back. Thanks for coming and joining us. Thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah. Glad to be here, and uh, y'all should all check out Trip Picks. So when y'all open, y'all open every day. Of yeah, we're open every single day. Um, we have three locations in Charleston and Mount Pleasant, and another one down the road in Columbia, South Carolina. Oh, okay, that's good to know. So yeah, we're here all day. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us, and we're definitely coming back next summer in Charleston, where I am. Perfect. Perfect. Enjoy cupcakes down south any day of the week, and remember, they have three different locations. 433 King Street in Charleston, South Carolina, 644 Long Point Road in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and finally, 1213 Lincoln Street in Columbia, South Carolina. And you can also find a complete menu at freshcupcakes.com. So we're having dinner tonight at Vincent Chico's, which is an Italian restaurant here in Charleston, and 
it is right off of King Street. Yeah, on John Street. Yes. Every place we've eaten so far has been... Somewhere near King Street. Vincent Chico's is a newer addition to the restaurants in Charleston. And the restaurant is named after an Italian immigrant to Charleston who became infamous as an activist during the Prohibition. Brittany and I take a seat with the chef and manager here to learn more about this fine dining hideaway. I'm here with Aaron and he is the executive chef here at Vincent Chico's. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no problem. Love to have you. So how long have you been here? Um, I've been uh, cooking in Charleston for about 12 years and I've been with this company about 8 years. Um, Vincent Chico's opened up back in 2014, been open uh, just over a year and uh, we're in uh, the alley on Hudson Street in Charleston, South Carolina. We serve traditional, authentic uh, Italian cuisine and Italian American cuisine. Traveled um, all through Tuscany, through Italy. Um, did lots of <clears throat> lots of trial, lots of error, but we like to have a balance of good old world Italian and also uh, new world Italian. A lot of just classic American dishes too. What um, what dish do you recommend the most here? Um, as far as authenticity goes, um, any of the dishes that are on the you know the Italian side of the menu, those are going to be like your cacio e pepe that y'all tried today. That's something that's comes right from Rome. Uh, you'll have it all through Tuscany, but it's a traditional dish. It took us a long time to really kind of nail, uh, nail it. Seems very simple, but there is a lot that kind of goes on behind the scenes with that. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, also, our daily fish feature, our ribeye feature, um, those are very good because those kind of just change with the season um, with the vegetables. And the chef has sent out all this food for us to try while we're waiting on our main course. And it all looks really, really good. Mm -hmm. We got uh, fresh uh, tomatoes. This is a rooftop tomato. Yeah, from the rooftop. Is it good? Mm -hmm. And then this is a uh, appetizer we ordered. Shetta? Shetta. Yes. It's like bread with a lot of tomatoes on it and um, It has a lot to do with the fact that I'm really hungry. But it's really good. It is good, right? How would you describe a dining experience here? A typical dining experience? Um, I would say it's very, um, it's very elegant, very sensual. It's also, you know, laid back. You can kind of have evoke the family style, but it can be romantic as well. There's, um, you know, there's a little mix here. There's a cultural clash, if you will, um, as far as the dining goes. Um, we are only open at night. Uh, we don't prefer, you know, uh, guys with ball caps and shorts. But other than that, uh, we won't kick you out. You know, as long as you coming in and you want to have a nice time. I really to try this because mm -hmm. I've been waiting for this because it looks this really has got good. Meat on the plate. Yes. And some kind of bread. And then whatever this is um some kind of roast type stuff. Is that good as well? Yeah, it's good. You can make a meal out of just this stuff. Oh. Um, so, can you tell us about some of the food you prepared for us tonight? Uh, so, I sent y'all out uh, our burrata, which is our house. We pull our own mozzarella in house and then we make a filling for it, which is chopped up mozzarella curd. Uh, it's called stracciatelle. And we serve that with a mixture of olives. We use uh, French pinchaline olives. We use Castle Beltrana olives, which Vincent Chico, uh, 
this restaurant's named after was Sicilian, so we have a lot of Sicilian play on the menu and a lot of various ingredients from doing research and kind of testing things. So you have Castle Beltrana olives. Uh, you're also going to have uh, Tagiasca olives, which those are rosemary marinated uh, olives. Then there's also some sun-dried tomatoes on there, some fresh tomato and uh, some basil, a little bit of uh, aged balsamic. So it's really nice, you know, again, the focus is the cheese, but the, uh, the accompaniments really kind of make it shine. Then our uh, beef carpaccio, we use a Wagyu beef tenderloin, and we dust that with some, you know, it's very traditional in the sense we use a coffee rub, coffee, uh, brown sugar, a little bit of esplet pepper, and sear it really hard, then serve that with a horseradish aioli, a little local arugula, some ginger marinated beets, just to kind of break the monotony of it. Um, you know, give it a little bit of a zing and spice. Then there is uh, some radishes from a rooftop garden and a little bit of olive oil in there as well. The, uh, the other dishes, entree-wise, the spaghetti and meatballs is just a classic. Again, it's just a standard dish. We had to have it if we were doing Italian-American. My, uh, my, my mother is Italian, so I did have some Italian, but it was more of, again, a home-style Italian. You know, there was no real authenticity to, you know, an, a region in Italy. It was more of, these are the way, you know, this is the way her mother taught her how to make them. Um, and our meatballs, again, we use a classic pork, beef, and veal mixture, and that really kind of uh, shines through. A lot of flavor. They, they hold up really well. Well, um, thank you for talking with us. No problem. And um, make sure you come. Vis and Chico's is a place where you can really feel comfortable. Come sit down, have a great meal, enjoy the fine dining experience, and really feel the history that comes alive in this comfortable restaurant. On the next episode of On the Map, we still have some high class restaurants to visit, as well as Middleton Place Plantation and the Inn at Middleton Place. Then we're going to wrap up our history tour with our tour guide, Linda. If you enjoyed this show, check out previous episodes and more on our YouTube channel. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at OnTheMapTV to get pics and updates as we're out on the road.